This is a course of lectures about the greatest war in history. It was called, simply, The Great War, at the time it was fought, between 1914 and 1918. It was a little bit downgraded later when it became the First World War, because by then we'd had a second one. But in Europe, at least, it has gradually been regaining that phrase, The Great War, as its title, as the Second World War has receded from close memory into history. The First World War now seems again to be the Great War. We're going to see in this course how the war ushered in so many aspects of the modern world. We will see how it was the first genuinely worldwide conflict in which almost all the major developed countries took part. There was fighting on all continents. It was the first war in which there was fighting on land, sea and in the air. We shall see too how it introduced modern weapons and munitions that had been developed and supplied by industrial economies in hitherto unimaginable quantities and with unbelievable destructive effectiveness. And I say unbelievable because those who participated found it hard to believe even at the time. We shall see too how the war shaped the international political scene for the rest of the century, since both fascism and communism can be seen as being spawned by the Great War. And the Great War changed, too, the relationship between the individual and the state, the gender relations of man and woman, and the role of artists and the media in free societies. It was the Great War. And as the American writer Paul Fussell has argued, the memory of the Great War remains a central part of our view of ourselves and what it means to live in the modern world. In this first lecture we're going to investigate the way in which a century of peace broke down in the first years of the 20th century. How the growth of Germany as an industrial and economic superpower led to her neighbours feeling challenged and sometimes frightened. We're going to analyse the way in which the Anglo-German relationship in particular broke down with competition in naval building. And that was so important because it was the Anglo-German antagonism that turned what would have been a European war into a world war. A world war in which countries like Japan and the United States could not stay outside the conflict. And finally we shall see how a relatively small incident, the assassination of a minor member of the European royal families in 1914 in Sarajevo, triggered a sequence of diplomatic events that plunged the entire civilised world into war and crisis. It was all so unexpected, and in the view of so many, it was also unnecessary. So first, let us look at that century of relative peace. What had kept the peace for a hundred years, since the Battle of Waterloo had ended Napoleon's dreams of French world empire in 1815? Well, there had been very few major wars, and they'd been mainly short and of geographically limited circumstances. I'm thinking here of the American Civil War. Bloody as it was, it was contained within a single country. Or the Crimean War of the 1850s. Or the war between France and Germany in 1870. These were short, these were limited, and they were not the characteristic of most of the 19th century. The 19th century was then, for the most part, a period of harmony, a period, too, of British economic and maritime dominance. It was the age, as historians say, of the Pax Britannica, the British peace, which seemed to rival the Roman peace, the Pax Romana of the Roman Empire. But it was a period that was dramatically coming to an end in the last years of the 19th century, as other countries caught up Britain economically and began to overtake her in certain industrial areas. The 19th century was also the great age of colonial expansion and of empires. Britain, France, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, and at the end of the century, Germany and the United States were all competing for overseas colonial possessions. For the most part, this ambition to conquer territories far away from the homeland countries was contained because each country developed separate spheres of influence. But where they collided 
where those interests came too close to be harmoniously resolved, then there was dangers of war and of collision. In 1897 and 1898, for example, Britain was near to going to war with the United States over Venezuela and the border with a British colony nearby, and was near to going to war with France over a dispute about territory in the centre of Africa. Britain was also, at the same time, in a very bad state of diplomatic relations with Russia over Afghanistan. But for the most part, the colonial expansion of the period could be maintained without the countries coming into conflict. Britain developed colonies mainly in India, in South Africa and in East Africa, France mainly in West Africa, Spain and Portugal in their separate zones. American expansion was mainly contained within the North American continent and Russian expansion mainly across Asia and Siberia. But the growing economic competition led to an accelerated demand for colonies at the end of the century. And in the 1890s and the early 1900s, colonial conflicts became much more difficult to avoid as new territories were scarcer and scarcer and the economic powers were searching for new sources of raw materials and new markets. This mattered much more because the 19th century was also the age of nationalism, as in each country active patriotic organisations existed to mobilise support for the national interest as it developed abroad and for expressions of national identity in a more direct manner than had been traditional in the past. This was the age in which more and more people were able to read and write. Fairly universal literacy had existed in Central Europe and, and Western Europe for about 20 years by the time that the First World War broke out. This meant, of course, that more and more people could read newspapers, could read about international affairs, could be mobilised to support political movements. And that meant, too, that the expectation of war was one that spread across all classes in the community when it began in the 20th century. But the expectation of a war was invariably of a short, heroic war of conquest, not of a long, drawn-out, bloody stalemate of the sort that happened in 1914, 15 and 16. A German soldier from Bavaria wrote in 1916, the brutality and inhumanity of war, what he'd experienced, stood in great contrast to what I'd heard and read about as a youth. He could be speaking for the whole generation in saying that. There was, though, a growing scale in the few wars that were actually fought, and an increasingly bitter antagonism at the popular level as newspapers whipped up support for their governments when the wars were on. The Great War would dwarf all these in scale. After just 18 months of the Great War, at the end of 1918, the United States had a million men in France fighting Germany, and almost two million actually in the army. But in 1864, Robert E. Lee's army was about 70,000, Grant had 120,000, and Sherman 80,000. The scale of warfare had increased dramatically in the half century after the American Civil War. In the same way, the, the last big attack that the American and French armies fought together in the Argonne in 1918 had 4,000 guns, 4,000 heavy artillery pieces. That's 100 guns for every kilometre of the front line. It's one for every 30 feet. They're almost standing axle to axle, firing eastwards towards Germany. There is nothing like that in the wars of the earlier 19th century. But this is also a period of the rise and decline of empires, and it was that that triggers the antagonism that brings about war in 1914. Spain, Portugal and latterly Britain are in decline, but most importantly, Turkey and Austria-Hungary are in deep trouble as political organisations at an international level, conscious that they cannot now support the large and extended territory that they've acquired in earlier years, in earlier centuries, and very conscious indeed that they have to impress their subject peoples to remain in existence as international entities. Just to give one example, within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Czech nation had become more and more conscious of being subjugated to Germans and Hungarians. <laughs> 
The Czechs had acquired a healthy literature in their own language, a great musical tradition. They'd begun to demand self-government, and they were a modern, industrialised part of Europe. They couldn't be held down for much longer. But all over Austria and Turkey, subject minorities were demanding their rights, and the imperial masters were looking nervously to the future. But the most important of these developments was the rise of Germany. German nationalism, by which I mean Germany's sense of being a nation in the modern sense, derived from the period in which Germans fought against Napoleon after 1806 and right through to the Battle of Waterloo, when, after all, the Germans and the British fought on the same side to defeat Napoleon in 1815. But German nationalism didn't become effective politically for another century. And the factor of great significance here was that when Germany was reunited in the 1860s, it was around the monarchy of Prussia, one of the German states, but it could easily have been a different German state with a different tradition and a different mentality around which Germany had been united. It was the Prussian monarchy that was the centre of the Union of Germany. It was the King of Prussia who became the German Emperor in 1871. But the Prussian historical tradition had always been one in which the army had a hugely important significance in national life. There was an alliance between relatively poor landowners in the eastern part of Prussia who acquired status, power and significance by their role in the Prussian army. And the united Germany of 1871 developed much more along Prussian lines as a more militarised, autocratic state than it would have done had Germany been united around, say, the Kingdom of Bavaria in the south. When the world went to war in 1914, a British liberal newspaper put this very well. It is not the German people who are the enemy, said the Daily News. It is the tyranny which has held them in its vice, the tyranny of personal government armed with a mailed fist, the tyranny of despotic rule. What they were saying here is that Germany was ruled by a single person, an autocratic monarch, supported by a brutal army and backed up by an enormous munitions industry. They talked about the power of the Kaiser being countersigned by Krupps. German national unity came through warfare, a sequence of wars between 1863 and 1871. And although the German statesman Bismarck combined tremendous tactical skills and political awareness, he used force to achieve Germany's initial aims, the creation of a German empire. It was Bismarck who coined one of the most famous phrases that politicians still use today, that politics is the art of the possible. But Bismarck also taught Germans to expect that success could be achieved by the naked use of military power. And his wars to conquer uh, the subject peoples and to make Germany an empire at the expense of Austria and France left wounded feelings, especially with France. Two historic French provinces, Alsace and Lorraine, on the eastern border of France, became part of Germany in 1871. This the French never forgave. This the French never ceased to dream of reversing. This was one of the things they were going to fight for in 1914. And when the First World War ended, Alsace and Lorraine came back to France. But Germany was also seen as the international patron of other nationalities. The Afrikaners, Dutch speakers in South Africa. The Dutch themselves in Europe. Germans in Eastern Europe, little pockets of German economic colonies in Russia, in Poland, in Austria, in Romania. Germany had a wide spread of interests. And there were, within Germany, a group of people known as Pan-Germans who wanted to unite German speakers the world over, even, indeed, some German speakers in the state of Wisconsin in the United States. They dreamed of a German world empire that would unite the German speakers in pursuit of a German-dominated world. This was not the whole of Germany, nothing like it, but they were a vocal minority, and they were listened to and cheered quite a bit. And then, crucially, with a new emperor, the Kaiser Wilhelm II, German international policy shifts in about 1890. 
the Kaiser sacks Bismarck and goes in for directing policy himself, goes in for what historians have always called since, as commentators did at the time, Weltpolitik, a world policy. Now, it's worth pausing to reflect that German expansion that aimed at world power was a threat that went well beyond the confines of a Franco-German rivalry of several centuries in the past. And it was for Germany as for the other countries, a popular newspaper industry read by millions of newly literate people that proclaimed and asserted that Germany had a claim to a place in the sun. But the question for her neighbours was, what would be the limits of Germany's ambitions? What would be the limits of German expansion? The most immediate consequence of the rise of Germany was to make some of her neighbours feel extremely threatened and nervous. For most of the 19th century, the powers of Europe had shifted around in continuously changing coalitions, a kaleidoscope of changing relationships. In 1820, Austria, Russia and Germany were allied to dominate most of Europe. By 1854, Britain and France and Italy, in effect, were fighting against Russia, with Germany neutral. In 1870, Germany was fighting against France, allied to Austria. But in 1894, at the beginning of this period of German Weltpolitik, the nations begin to settle down into lasting alliances. By 1894, Germany, Austria and Italy have formed a triple alliance that remains continuously in existence. And in 1894 too, France and Russia form a close binding and military alliance. Those are most of the two sides that come to fight the Great War 20 years later. This is the period in which the colonial conflicts are beginning to run down. There are no new colonies to actually conquer by the middle and end of the 19th century. It isn't only the United States that has a closed frontier in the 1890s. It's also Russia, and it's to a large extent the colonial powers in Africa too. So there is a shift of everybody's focus back towards Europe, dangerous shift. And we see there already a way in which what, what become known as the central powers, the powers of Central Europe, especially Germany and Austria, face encirclement because France on the west and Russia on the east are allied against them. But this only suggested that there would be a European war. It wasn't going to be a world war unless it involved countries with naval power. In this period, Britain was not attached to any of the alliance blocs and was easily the most powerful navy of the world. Britain indeed needed to be the most powerful navy in the world because she had more of her trade outside Europe than the other European countries and she had more colonies than anyone else. But for the most part, from 1870 through to the mid-1890s at least, there was a rough balance of power, a standoff was maintained in Europe. Germany had the best army, Britain had the best navy. And since armies can't defeat navies and navies can't defeat armies, neither of them felt particularly threatened by the other. France was too fearful of German power to provoke a war, even to win back her lost provinces. And Germany was too strong militarily for Russia to attack her either. The crucial difference would come when Britain was part of an alliance with France and Russia. This would destabilise the balance and create the circumstances that led on to world war. After 1890, there was then a growing antagonism between Britain and Germany, especially over conflicts in South Africa. It was a conflict and antagonism that developed at every level. Diplomatic conflict, personal conflict between the kings of the two countries, press antagonism in which the newspapers of one country shouted abuse at the other, debates in Parliament, and all the ways we can measure public opinion. There were, in fact, alliance talks between Britain and Germany between 1900 and 1902, but they led nowhere. The two countries were now heading into conflict, not into alliance. And the main reason that triggered that growing antagonism between Britain and Germany, with all its implications for world war, was Germany's decision to build a large navy. From 1898, a new head of the German Admiralty, Admiral von Tirpitz, 
began building battleships on a grand scale and began mobilizing support among the German people, an extremely well-supported, well-funded Navy League to build up popular support for German battleships. This was inherently threatening to Britain. As an island, Britain depended on control of the seas around the country, and since Britain had a very small army, and it was mainly spread around India and the rest of the British Empire, German control of the seas off the British islands would in itself guarantee that Germany could win a war. In fact, wouldn't even need to go to war, because she could force Britain to accept terms. The British army would never defeat the German army. Once the German fleet became equal to the British fleet, Britain would be in deep trouble. The whole idea of British identity seemed to be threatened. And Britain was awash in the Edwardian period before 1914 with spy novels, invasion novels, scares about the navy. Kaiser Wilhelm II, or rather more popularly known Kaiser Bill, became a bogeyman for the British people and his own rather dangerous posturings. He made a speech, for example, when he dreamed of the time when he would be the Admiral of the Atlantic Ocean. This did nothing to reassure the British. It mattered more to Britain than to anyone else who controlled the seas. The First Lord of the Admiralty, the British minister responsible for the Navy, put it very well in 1902, when this story had only just begun. To us, he wrote, defeat in a maritime war would mean a disaster of almost unparalleled magnitude in history. It might mean the destruction of our mercantile marine, the stoppage of our manufactures, scarcity of food, invasion, disruption of empire. No other country runs the same risk in a war with us. It was Britain that was vulnerable, and it was therefore Britain which had to fight back. And there was, from 1902 to 1914, a competition to see who could build battleships fastest. The German Navy became, within ten years, the third biggest navy in the world. But the British Navy remained the biggest. It was a naval race that Britain was actually bound to win, because Britain didn't have to put money into the army at the same time as Germany did. So why did Germany persist in a policy that was sure to antagonise Britain, and which was a race it couldn't win? Well, more than anything, the answer to that question is about dreams of great power status. A navy was one of the signs of what a great power was. It's what a great power did, was to rule the seas as well as the land. If Germany was to be an independent national empire, Germany should be allowed to have a navy too. And so warnings from other countries fell on deaf ears in Berlin, and Germany persisted in policies that antagonised Britain. The most immediate consequence of this was that Britain, which had been mainly isolated from those great blocks of powers, came out of its isolation soon after the beginning of the 20th century. In 1902, Britain signed a treaty with Japan, and in 1904, what was called an entente with France. An entente simply means an understanding. It was not a military alliance. And both the Japanese and the French deals with Britain were very limited in their scope. But they suggested that Britain was now looking for friends no longer standing proudly isolated. What turned those understandings into alliances was German policy. A diplomatic crisis in Morocco in 1904 persuaded Britain to stand by France, and at the end of those diplomatic negotiations, Germany had to climb down, but immediately afterwards, the British and French generals began to talk to each other about military cooperation in a possible European war. A few years later, Britain moves on in 1907 to ally with Russia. Again, it's an understanding, an entente, not an alliance. But it means that the two blocks of powers that will fight in 1914 are now assembled, seven years before the war actually happens. In 1911, there's almost a war in Europe. The entente powers of Britain, France and Europe once again become closer under the stress of a diplomatic crisis. And again, the next thing that happens is the admirals and the generals get together and plan more closely for how they will cooperate in the future. Increasingly, Germany looks at this with horror, although it is, to most historians' perception, a situation entirely of its own creation. Germany now faces what German military leaders had dreaded for a century, 
a war on two fronts. The enormous Russian army coming over the steppes into East Prussia in the east, France in the west, Britain at sea. Germany is in danger of being in encircled. How will Germany react to this situation? How will Germany plan for a war on two fronts? That then becomes a matter not for politicians or diplomats, but for the military. And Germany develops something called the Schlieffen Plan. It's named simply after Count Alfred von Schlieffen, who's the head of the Prussian general staff, when the plan is developed. The Schlieffen Plan determines that Russia will be a bit slow to mobilise. Russia is a more backward country with fewer railways, a poorer administration, as we shall certainly see when we look at this in Lecture 7 of the course. If Russia is slow, then Germany must defeat France in the West before Russia can mobilise effectively. And Germany therefore plans a knockout blow in the West. This is the Schlieffen Plan. The trouble with this, of course, is that governments and their armies become dependent on these plans once they committed themselves to it. And as the world edged towards war in 1910, 1911, 1912, 1913, Germany's military leaders became so committed to this plan that it became effectively the only scenario they could imagine for the way in which a war could be fought. Even if a war actually started in Eastern Europe, they would begin it by attacking France in the West. This removed a huge amount of flexibility from the diplomats when it came to trying to deal with the crisis that actually promoted the First World War in 1914. All over Europe, indeed, armies planning to mobilise millions of men developed the most detailed and comprehensive war books. Each country had a war book, and the war book specified in immense detail how every single military unit would be taken to a certain station, get on a certain train, be passed along the lines to another station. Every single part of it was determined by the railway timetables. The British historian A.J.P. Taylor famously wrote in the 1960s that in 1914 Europe went to war by timetable. It was a war by timetable. The problem, of course, is that once you're committed to that sort of immensely complicated process of getting your army going at the beginning of a war, it's very, very difficult to change the plan. Most of these timetables had no reverse gear. There was no way of even stopping the machine without causing absolute chaos of millions of men wandering around railway junctions with no trains for them to get onto and no way to get home. So increasingly, in those last years of peace, the heads of state, the kings, the emperors, and their leading political advisers, the democratic governments of France and Britain, were losing control of the agenda. The military and naval planning took over. The generals and the admirals were effectively in charge of the process. And this leads us into the sequence of diplomatic crises that finally prompt the war in 1914. July and August 1914 provide indeed a wonderful way of investigating the whole principle of historical causation. Everything that I've described so far provided the circumstances in which a great war could happen. But they didn't mean there had to be a great war. As I said, Britain almost went to war with France in 1898, but didn't. Almost went to war with Russia too. Something was different in 1914. Something that explains why war did happen this time. And the circumstances are not sufficient. Or to put it another way, when we're looking at this sort of event we have to identify not only the powder, but also the spark. I've been describing the powder up to this point. Now we get to the spark. The spark is all to do with obscure politics in the European Balkans. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, as I've mentioned, was one of the most unstable and weak of the declining empires of Europe. It was full of subject peoples dreaming of national freedom. One of those countries that had actually succeeded in getting free from the Turks and the Austrians was Serbia. A proud, assertive people now running their own country with growing aspirations to help their neighbours to be free of Austria too. And the last couple of years of peace, well, European-wide peace, were actually periods of Balkan wars. 
as the Serbs fought against the Bulgarians and the Turks, and then a shifting alliance meant that new groups of powers fought each other soon afterwards. This was watched with horror in Vienna. The Austrians could foresee their empire falling apart. There was great pressure on the Austrian government to assert itself, to show its subject peoples that it could still rule them. And at precisely this moment, in June 1914, the heir to the Austrian throne, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, is assassinated in Sarajevo. Well, Sarajevo is in Bosnia, as we may remember from later events, not in Serbia, but it's a Serbian nationalist student who kills the Archduke. This lights a very slow-burning fuse that takes almost six weeks to provoke a European war. And it wasn't expected to have anything like those consequences in the days after the assassination. But Austria has to show Serbia who is master. And so they ask immediately for tough terms. The villains must be punished. Serbia must apologise. Uh, all sorts of other compensations have to be paid. To the amazement of the world, Serbia agrees to these terms, because Serbia is in no condition to fight Austria on its own. But what's going to go on in these diplomatic wranglings in June and July 1914 is a slip into world war. Not expected at all. In fact, when the Archduke was shot in Sarajevo, his dying words to his wife, who was also dying as it happened, were supposed to be, Sophie, Sophie, don't die. Live for the children's sake. It's nothing. It's nothing, was his comment on the shot that led Europe and the world into war. But immediately, the diplomatic processes began to get out of control. Serbia agreed to Austria's terms, and Austria immediately upped the terms and demanded more. And at precisely the same time, Germany assured Austria that if led into European conflicts, Germany would back Austria to the hilt. So Germany has now lost control because she's promised in advance to support anything that Austria will do. But immediately that meant that all those alliances were going to come into conflict because if Germany and Austria went to war against Serbia in the Balkans, these were Germans attacking a Slav people. Russia was the great patron of the world's Slavs, as much as Germany was the great patron of the world's German speakers. Russia could not stand back and watch a Serb independent state being destroyed by a declining Austrian Empire. And if Russia came into the war, then France was going to come into the war, because France had a binding alliance with Russia. And of course, if France went into the war, Germany would have to invade France using the Schlieffen Plan because that was the only plan they had for dealing with a war against France and against Russia. And what would Britain do in those circumstances? Britain had no detailed binding alliance with either France or Russia. But Britain's generals had been talking to France about what they'd do when the war happened. The British admirals knew that the French Navy was depending on the Royal Navy, the British Navy, to defend the northern coast of France against a possible German attack. Britain was more committed than they knew and all the rest of the diplomats were losing control of the situation. Viewed from the United States, this just seemed to be a catastrophic failure of old-fashioned European diplomacy. In many ways, of course, that's just what it was. And so between the 28th of July and the 3rd of August in 1914, Germany, France, Austria, Serbia and Russia have all declared war. The centre and west of Europe are going to war. Britain is not yet part of it. Britain hesitates, and then goes in only on the 4th of August, and only goes in when Germany invades Belgium. We'll look in the next lecture about why Belgium was so important. But for the moment it's important to note, Britain was almost certainly going to go into that war anyway. But because Germany invaded Belgium, a small, neutral country that wasn't allied to anybody, and didn't want to invade anybody, Britain was given a great excuse for joining the war in defence of a small country. And that was exactly the way it was described. When the news came through to Berlin, the German Imperial Chancellor, Bettmann Hollweg, was incensed. Just for a word, he said. Neutrality. A word that in wartime has so often been disregarded. Just for a scrap of paper. Great Britain is going to make war on a kindred nation. 
which desires nothing better than to be friends with her. Well, Chancellor Bettman Holbeg much regretted later using the phrase a scrap of paper to describe a treaty between two countries. It seemed to suggest to the propagandists, once the war really got going, that Germany did not respect treaties, just as Germany had invaded Belgium, even though Belgium was not actually at war uh, with Germany or allied to France. So to conclude, we need to look at the very question that I've been skirting around up to this point. Who was really responsible for the Great War? Well, when the war ended, there was no doubt, legally speaking, the victorious Allies made the Germans sign a clause in the Treaty of Versailles that said that Germany had caused the war. And this became an important historical fact in its own right, but not for the period that we shall cover in this course. We need, of course, to distinguish between the short term and the long term, the powder and the fuse. But we also need to be aware of the broad but separate impact of the continuous rhetoric of German Weltpolitik, ambitions that none of her neighbours were comfortable with, none of them could see where they were going to lead. War-mindedness was common right across Europe, that's certainly true. There was so much excitement in August 1914 in all the European capitals, as we shall see in the second lecture. So perhaps not enough was done in any country to stave off the real thing when it threatened in June and July 1914. But in the long term, it was German ambitions that were destabilising its neighbours, making its neighbours feel threatened, pushing them into alliances, making them make those alliances tighter and more reliable, so they become more dependent on their friends. And it was Britain's alliance with France, after all, that was what gave the French their chance in a war against Germany, because it would be two to one in the West. In the short term, then, German encouragement of Austria was a key moment in turning a crisis into a war. Germany's dependence on the Schlieffen Plan was a critical factor in turning a local war into a European-wide war, and German invasion of Belgium brought in Britain and eventually the United States and made it a world war. Historians don't like coming to clear and unambiguous conclusions on huge historical issues, but most of those who in the last 20 or 30 years have looked at the question of who caused the Great War, have come down on the side of Germany. It was the view of Fritz Fischer, a very eminent German historian in the 1960s and 70s, of Paul Kennedy at Princeton, writing in the 1970s. And it was the view as recently as 2003 of two eminent American historians, Robin Winks and R.J.Q. Adams. When one asks which nation finally disturbed the status quo in Europe, sufficiently to bring on the war, they wrote. It is difficult to answer with any other name than Germany. We shall see in Lecture 2 what happened in the autumn of 1914, how an exciting war developed, very different from the historical memory of what the Great War was like, but how it was a war that Germany did not win in August to December 1914, and which then set the world in that long, bloody slog of the trenches. This ends Lecture 1.